Mark chapter 10 and verse 35 this morning. I'm going to echo Aaron's gratefulness for the servants who got up early in the cold and the many others who serve our church week after week after week in various ways. Those of you who serve one another in private ways at home, we are, as pastors, very, very grateful for the servant-heartedness of this church. And it, it actually makes the passage we're about to consider a reason for fresh gratefulness, as I think you'll see because of our affection for the servant-hearted nature that we see in our church. But let's remember as we read that this is God's Word. It comes to us with His authority, with the expectation of changing our lives, that our lives would be different as a result of this Word. That's why we come week after week to sit under God's Word so that we can be affected by it, we can be submitted to it, we can be shaped by it. So let's begin reading Mark chapter 10. In verse 35, and James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came up to him and said to him, teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, what do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, grant us to sit one at your right hand and one at your left in your glory. Jesus said to them. You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or to be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? And they said to him, we are able. Then Jesus said to them, the cup that I drink, you will drink. And with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. And when the ten heard it, they began to be indignant at James and John. And Jesus called them to him and said to them, You know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Lord, bless the preaching and the obeying of your word. Some of you may know the name Roger Federer. If you don't, don't worry about it, but I'll introduce him a little bit to you this morning. Roger Federer is by all accounts, considered one of the greatest tennis players of all time. He has won 103 singles titles, including 20 Grand Slam titles, a record eight Wimbledon titles, and a record six year-end championships. During the 2017 U.S. Open, young fans were allowed to interview Federer, and young one boy, one, one young boy had a particular line of questioning, somewhat unexpected, for the tennis star. He began by wanting to confirm with Federer that Switzerland, Federer's home country, Switzerland, is a cold country. Federer confirmed, yes, most of the time it, it is cold. The boy then commented that since the country was cold, they probably don't have much livestock. Federer seemed temporarily perplexed at this line of question, curious perhaps, unusual line of questioning for a tennis star. But then the boy got to the point. Since it's a cold country, there's not a lot of livestock, why do people call you the goat? <laughs> the crowd laughed, and some of you laughed, and some of you have no idea why that's funny. Uh, 
The reason that the boy asked that is that GOAT is a sports acronym, and it's probably used in other fields as well, for the greatest of all time. And so various sports debates go around who is the GOAT of basketball, GOAT of football, GOAT of tennis, the greatest of all time. Well, the boy apparently hadn't gotten that memo yet, and he was just curious why this magnificent tennis player was being addressed as livestock. He wanted to know why that was a title of honor, especially since I can imagine goats are not known for anything magnificent other than eating trash, and typically you wouldn't assign it's a somewhat ironic title, actually, because to be a goat is not typically considered a designation of honor. But to be the greatest of all time, that certainly is a designation of honor. And actually, I think the irony of this title is something like the irony that Jesus talks about in this passage. The irony that we call the greatest of all time, the goat, as an ironic nickname, is similar to what Jesus is saying in this passage about the unexpected nature of true greatness. What is true greatness? What is it? And who decides it? Is it merely a matter of opinion with some people weighing values differently? Is it totally subjective or perhaps like a sports analysis? It changes from one era to the next. Perhaps it's a title that can be delivered from one person in one era to another person in another era. What if, what if there were broader, more important categories beyond things like sports? What if there was a scale of greatness in humanity? What would true greatness be? What is true greatness? What would qualify someone to be considered great, truly, undeniably, unarguably great? And who could claim the title of greatest of all time? That's what Jesus is getting to in this passage. He has just announced to his disciples in the context of this passage is his declaration that he is going to Jerusalem, that contrary to their expectations, he will not ride into military victory and assume political control over the people. Rather, he will suffer. He will be betrayed. He will be executed. He will rise again. But apparently, the disciples do not yet perceive the nature or the truth of that prediction. They're still thinking of him as an earthly ruler. And James and John have apparently strategized that they would like to get an advance assignment to the most honorable places in Jesus' kingdom. They want to try to convince Jesus to commit early that once you are in power, we would like something from you. We are looking to be at your right hand and your left. Commonly understood places of honor. The right hand person was the highest honor. Left hand was the second highest, perhaps. And the brothers are saying, look, we don't particularly care who gets that, but we want to make sure one of us is in one seat and one of us is in the other. So they're viewing Jesus as sort of a David-like monarch. When he comes into his power, they want the places right next to him. The first section of this story talks about this interaction Jesus has with these disciples, and I might caption it blind ambition. There's two sections this morning, blind ambition and true greatness. Blind ambition and true greatness. These brothers, Jesus is aware, do not know what they are asking. They want to sit at the right hand and the left, but you notice in verse 38, Jesus says, you do not know what you are asking. He tests whether they understand this request by asking whether they are up to the cost of the request with a pair of questions. Are you able, he says, to drink the cup in verse 38 that I drink or to be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? Apparently, these positions of glory in the kingdom of Christ are not ones that can just be granted to anyone. They come with a certain pre-condition. 
You know when you went to college, if you went to college or classes or whatever, and that sometimes you go and they say, look, you have to have taken certain classes in order to be in this other class, or you have to have a job, or you have to have a certification, you have to have this in order to be this. Well, apparently Jesus is saying this isn't just a bestowal of political favors here. There is something that has to happen that qualifies a person for this kind of future glory. Now, this was not a line of questioning they were expecting, perhaps, because he uses these metaphors. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or to be baptized with my baptism? Now, the readers of Mark will know, and we do because we've been reading through this book together, that this cup and baptism is referring to his sacrifice. He has just said, I am going to Jerusalem to suffer and die. It's important that we see the background of this metaphor of a cup. Very important that we understand what the background is. We understand what Jesus is asking them. The cup in the Old Testament is a common metaphor for a portion. It makes sense that when you come to a dinner or something, somebody serves you a cup. So it came to be a metaphor for the portion that you have in life. Something that God gives to a person. It can be used positively, like, for example, in Psalm 16.5, where we read, The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. It's the idea of a portion, something that you are given. But here, it seems to have a negative assessment. And we read about that kind of view of a cup, for example, in Psalm 75. For in the hand of the Lord there is a cup with foaming wine well mixed, and he pours out from it, and all the wicked of the earth shall drain it down to the dregs. Or, for example, in Isaiah 51, 17, wake yourself, wake yourself, stand up, O Jerusalem, you who have drunk from the hand of the Lord the cup of his wrath, who have drunk to the dregs, the bowl, the cup of staggering. John Stott commenting on Jesus, I think commenting likely on Jesus' request of his father in the Garden of Gethsemane, is there any way possible that this cup can pass from me? He says this, the cup from which he shrank was something different. It symbolized neither the physical pain of being flogged and crucified, nor the mental distress of being despised and rejected even by his own people, but rather the spiritual agony of bearing the sins of the world, in other words, of enduring the divine judgment which those sins deserved. Stott is saying that though certainly there was, I'm sure in Jesus, no desire to experience the physical pain and the betrayal, that was a part broadly of the cup, but the essence of it, the essence of what he was most anticipating was this idea that the cup represented God's judgment on sin And for him, that was the cup he was anticipating. Now, more broadly, he is saying to these men, I am going to a place of suffering. I will have to take on a suffering that has been assigned to me. In his case, a unique, unrepeatable suffering. But he is saying to them, look, you seem to think of my kingdom as as something that I can just grant glory right and left. And you need to understand, no, no, there is something to following me that will require following after my sacrifice as well. He's already said this to them earlier when he says, if anyone would follow me, he must take up his cross and follow me. There is no easy path of following Jesus. Here he uses the metaphor of a cup. He also references a baptism. Baptism is a mark of dedication. It's a mark of declaring that you belong or are following after some manner of life. And at the very least, Jesus is saying that the ultimate mark of dedication to his role will be on a hill outside Jerusalem where he will be plunged into the fury of God's judgment against sin, all to rescue his people from the judgment that they deserve. So we go back to the passage with that as the background, and Jesus says, are you able to? To drink the cup that I drink? Or to be baptized with the baptism that I am facing? Are you able to do so? There is a hint here of the definition of true greatness. The greatness that they want apparently does not come merely for the asking. 
Rather, it comes in connection to a particular kind of assignment, a particular portion from the Lord, a way of life that gladly embraces the kind of suffering and sacrifice that is true of those who follow a crucified Messiah. If you are asking for that level of greatness, he says, are you prepared for the package of suffering that comes with it? Yet it seems, apparently, a major part of their blindness is not only ignorance of the depth of his suffering, but ignorance of their own weakness as well. Verse 39, words, I am sure that in later days they cringed to remember. We are able. We are able. You can hear the similarity in in Peter's words just a week later where he says, even if all fall away from you, I will not. There is throughout this passage in the disciples a kind of self-righteous self-confidence. It's not wrong that they they want to be associated with Jesus in His glory. Jesus doesn't rebuke them for their aspiration to true glory with Him. He doesn't rebuke them for that. There's something right and good about wanting to be with Jesus in His glory and even aspiring to a kind of greatness in alignment with Him. What is wrong and blind about their ambition is not that they want to be with Jesus in His glory. It's that they don't understand this suffering required of that place, of following Him, and they are supremely self-confident about their ability to face that suffering. Like, like Peter, it was good that he wanted to stand with Jesus to the end, but he did not appreciate the weakness of his own limitations and his need of dependence on God to help him be faithful to that road. That's why when they go with him to the garden, Peter and these two guys, James and John, when Jesus says, watch that you may not fall into temptation, the spirit indeed is willing, good, but the flesh is weak. What's he saying? You have a cup to drink as well. And you won't drink it well if you trust in your own strength. We see that kind of self-confidence in these men. We are able, he says. Jesus, I'm sure, I imagine tenderly, predicts the cup that I drink, you will drink. And the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized, in verse 39. I'm sure Mark wrote those words with some emotion, thinking of these two men, James and John, later when their eyes were opened to the reality of Jesus' kingdom. D. Edmund Hebert, the commentator, reminds us that James indeed became the first apostle to drink the cup of martyrdom, while John, although escaping physical martyrdom, was a living martyr, suffering persecution, banishment, and the loneliness of old age, being left behind as the last apostle to stand against the pervading trend toward apostasy. In their ignorance, there was a genuine desire that Jesus says will ultimately come true, though far beyond their imagination, they will indeed drink their own cup of suffering. They will indeed be baptized by the difficulty of being associated with Jesus. But, he says, it's important for you to understand what you have asked, this request to sit at my right hand and and my left, that's not mine to grant. It's important to understand here that Jesus, even as he anticipates his glory, views himself as surrendered to the ultimate will of his Father. He views himself as aligned with that will, gladly rejoicing in it. There will never be a point where Jesus seeks to to resist or rebel against his Father's will even after the cross. He says, that's not mine to grant. There is a a place at my right hand and my left that is, is prepared for those from before this conversation. So yes, you have a path to tread, but but I I cannot tell you who will be at the right hand and the left hand when I come into my glory. We find out then that the the 10, verse 41, 
hear of this request, they are, and I want you to notice this word in your Bibles, they began to be indignant at James and John. Now, I I would just like to say, in that word, I see a reflection of one of my greatest sins. Personally, one of my greatest battle struggles with sin is that I am self-righteous toward the self-righteous. And that's what those guys were. They were indignant. They weren't indignant out of like holy concern for Jesus. You stop bothering him. No, no. No, these guys were indignant that these two had conspired to co-opt their place and to try to get in ahead of them. They wanted to have the same shot at being close to Jesus' right side. They didn't like it that they'd been outmaneuvered and James and John had gone in first. So what are they? They're indignant. I've said before, I think self-righteous indignation is the language of our age. It's the language of Twitter. It's the language of Facebook. Self-righteous indignation. How can you be so terrible? I'm shocked at how terrible you are, says the terrible person. I'm shocked at how lousy your life is. Well, that's what's going on with these guys. How dare you be so ambitious as to claim this place before Jesus? Who do you think that you are? who do you think that you are? To tell them who do they think that they are. There is a a self-righteousness. I see my own heart all the time. When someone is self-righteous, my typical response is to be self-righteous right back. Man, do you realize how cocky you are? (laughs) Do you realize how arrogant, how, I mean, I am indignant at your indignant way of living. You are so self-righteous. And then I have to pause and say, yes, Lord, and so am I. There was a blind ambition in the disciples. They didn't appreciate Jesus' suffering. They weren't humbled by it. They weren't aware. They weren't perceptive that when he said he was going to suffer, he meant it literally. This wasn't just Jesus throwing out some metaphor. No, this is Jesus literally anticipating his road to glory is through his cross of shame. And since they are going to Jerusalem with him, since he tells them to take up their cross behind him, this is their road to glory as well. They, like him, will follow a road of difficulty on their way to glory. There is no glory, Jesus says, without a corresponding cross. Because the one who is all glory bore the cross and we are united to him. Now, we do not suffer to save ourselves because his suffering was sufficient. But we follow the suffering Savior. And so in this world, he tells us, you will suffer. Prideful ambition, apparently, if we look at these disciples, it can be revealed in all kinds of ways. It can be revealed in people who have spent the last three years with Jesus. It can be revealed in Christians. It can be revealed in religious garb. Self-confidence can be revealed in a religious context. Listen, the name of Christ does not eliminate the presence of this kind of blind, self-confident ambition and arrogance from the heart of his followers. These disciples, like all of us, had an insufficient understanding of true greatness in the kingdom of God. And that flowed from an insufficient understanding of the great one who stood before them and the nature of his road to glory. They were blind, even as we are often blind. Our sight of greatness is dim or reversed by the thinking of this world. We think of greatness often as accomplishments or something that we have received that has nothing to do with suffering and difficulty and weakness, whereas the Scriptures seem to indicate the opposite. Jesus is aware of this. So He calls the disciples to Him again and talks to them about true greatness. Second section in this passage, true greatness. Greatness. Notice in verse 42, Jesus called them to him in the midst, apparently, of their self-ambitious squabbling. Jesus calls them over and says, you know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it 
over them. And their great ones exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so among you. Jesus defines in this passage true greatness. He first says what it is not. He identifies a typical pattern of the great ones of this world, those with their earthly authority who lord it over others. They assume that their greatness means being served by those beneath you or somehow showing others that they are beneath you. Hebert says about this phrase, he says these, these, they use their lordship to their own advantage. I I like that phrase. It gets to what Jesus is saying here. The assumption is to be great is to be able to use others to your advantage. It's to be the case that others look out for your interests. And that's right. That's the way it ought to be. You oppress others or insist that they are for you. That's what Jesus is getting to. That's the definition of greatness in the world. When people will look out for you. And the more people that are willing to do that, the more people that will serve you, that will be conscious of you, that will focus on you, the greater you are. The greater you are, the more people you have that are subserving themselves for you. That's the definition of worldly greatness. You are the center of a kingdom of people who are looking to treat you as a little king. That's what worldly greatness is, Jesus says. And he says, that shall not be so among you. That shall not be so among you. There is to be no self-exaltation among the followers of Christ. There is to be no self-exaltation among the followers of Christ. None of that, he says. No self-serving arrogance. No condescending treatment of others. No ambition to show ourselves superior. And whether we wear a crown or we have a particular kind of job or we just have a particular manner of speech towards others, how easy to see how it is sometimes present among us. We don't need a title or a crown to treat others as if our goal is to show our superiority over them. Jesus says, it shall not be so. It shall not be so among you. It's like a parent with his children, isn't it? You may not. You may not, the master says. You may not use your position, your role, your intellect, your possessions as a means of revealing superiority over others. You may not, he says. It shall not be so among my people. No boasting, no bragging, no condescension, no belittling, not among my people. Normal in the world, obviously. Normal in the world. Even when it's clothed by the kind of social niceties in a day that doesn't appreciate overt bragging and yet appreciates subtle bragging. No, he says, not not just the hypocritical claim to humility when inside there's a boasting about being arrogant. No, no, he says, not so among you. Not just the facade of arrogance. No condescension at all. Not so among my people. Not so. Not the kind of boasting we see on social media. Looking good today. Check this out. Subtly. Not the kind of tyranny we might see in those who do have positions of power and treat in a demeaning manner those who are under their care and charge. Not the kind of arrogant dismissiveness of those who have social or cultural power towards those who are social outcasts. No, he says, not so among you. Now, I need this command. I need this command because I'm not that different from these guys. 
I'm really not that different. We're not that much more mature than James and John. Not really. Now, we might be more subtle, and we've been in Christian long enough to not say it so overtly, remembering they never read the Gospel of Mark, and so some of what we're getting benefit from is having actually read their story that they didn't get to read. So no, we're not like way more mature. We just have learned a few more things, and so we're a little more subtle about being arrogant. But ultimately, I'm not that much more mature than them. So we need this ordinary statement, not so among you. Rather, he says, it is the opposite. Whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And there's something remarkable here. Jesus, Jesus offers the definition of greatness, which in this day and age would have been something that most people would never even dare to aspire to. This isn't America, right, where people think, and even if it's an illusion, I have the ability to be great if only I set my mind to it. This isn't like Disney World, where if you set your heart to be anything, you can miraculously be that thing. No, 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 this is not what that is. This is a world where people get, I was born to a certain place, I'm going to stay there or go down. That's the normal expectation. Other people were born to an impressive great place, and they're going to stay there, and I'm going to stay here. Jesus actually expands that and says, whoever wants to be great, there is a road to greatness in the kingdom of God. Whoever. Doesn't matter who your father was. Doesn't matter about your intellect. Doesn't matter about your physical appearance, your health. It doesn't matter if you have good contacts. It doesn't matter if you have great academic background. It doesn't matter any of those things. Whoever wants to be great, here is the way to greatness. Whoever wants to be great shall be your servant. True greatness, what does it mean? It means serving others for their good and God's glory. True greatness, serving others for their good and God's glory. And then he elevates it. He says, whoever would be first among you, first among you, primary, the supremacy, the winner, who's first? The person that is the slave of all. Now that, that word actually means slave. Obviously we have difficulty with that understanding in this country because of the, the awful horror of enslaving others, which is an evil and a sin. But in the scripture, the word slave shouldn't be minimized to mean something more or only like servant, because it does mean more than that. It's not endorsing humans' in slavery of others or enslaving of others, but it is saying something about a, a way we ought to view ourselves in relation to others. We have no right to enslave others, and yet we are called, we could put it this way, in a spiritual sense, to count ourselves the slave of all if we would be great. You might have the idea of a servant as sort of an employee who punches in and punches out, but a slave has this added idea of belonging to, of, of your time is, is not just sort of temporarily offered, but is a, an identity, a, a, there's a possessive element to this. You are the slave, and Jesus says, of who? Of the great one? No, of all you are the slave of all? This, this would have been so countercultural. Well, no, you're, you're the slave of the great ones. Now he says the great one is the slave of all. Well, no, the great ones have slaves. No, no, the great one is the one who's the slave of all. You, you can feel the incomprehension likely present, can't you? That way, okay, it's, go to, do that again for me, Jesus. I don't understand. There's great ones. We all know that, great ones. There he is, riding by in his chariot. There's a great one. And you see that guy running behind him? That's a slave. He belongs to him, takes his sandals off, washes his feet, makes sure he has dinner, gets up early, goes to bed late. That's a slave. He's the slave of the great one. No, no, Jesus says, that's the great one. And not just the slave of the great one. The greatest one is the one who counts himself the slave of all. What is true greatness? Now, here, here's one of those moments where, man, we can turn this into a Bible magnet and nod at it and be like, oh, isn't that sweet? The slave of all. And it means something like 
sometimes help people or something. Occasionally be a servant or be kind on Mother's Day because your mom is a servant or make sure you thank the person at Starbucks. It, it means like sort of this gentle, be nice, be a servant, pass it on, like this kind of American, just help other people, you know, one thing to the next, pay for the guy's coffee. Look, th this is more radical than that. We, we shouldn't minimize this by moderating it. He doesn't say be nice to everybody. He says be the slave of everybody. He doesn't say treat people with sweetness and they'll pass it on to somebody else. He says treat people, if I can say this cautiously, as if they own you. Now you have to put caveats in. No one should be required to sin. People should not actually, physically, legally possess other people. Obviously, enslaving someone is a sin. But I'm saying in terms of our disposition towards others, it ought to be, I am eager to give of my time to you because I am on the road to true greatness. I think sometimes, I've spoken about this before as we've gone through Mark, the danger in these passages is not always that we don't fully understand what Jesus is saying. It's that we want to believe there's got to be some middle option. I've spoken of this before, right? There's this middle option. So there's obviously the worldly, arrogant braggart. I know I'm not supposed to be that. That's terrible. That arrogant musician that just swaggers in and just assumes everybody should do it. The diva. Oh, man, I would never. I would never be that. I could, divas are so impressed with themselves. Look at that person bragging on Twitter, TikTok all about themselves all the time. I would, oh gosh, just so annoying. No, I'm a Christian. What do we mean by that? I think we mean something like less than that, but neither what Jesus is saying either. It's sort of like I'm, I'm a temporary servant. I sometimes serve people. Sometimes. Sometimes I serve people. You know, it's important not to be too tired. <laughs> it's important to have a comfortable life. It's important to make sure you fulfill your dreams. It's good to enjoy the good things of life. And by the way, fit serving in somewhere. It's this middle road position that stops short of what Jesus is saying. It's like we spoke about when he says, take up your cross and follow me. I think sometimes we think, well, take up your inconvenience and follow me. And we sort of say, well, you know, I'm not, I'm not just a self-indulgent person. No, I, I take up my inconvenience from time to time. No, take up your cross and follow me. We're, we're very good at caveats, I think, in the American church, and we need to be, because it could be misunderstood. Could there be a Christian who views this to a point of unhealthiness where they, they begin sinning by neglecting some aspects of their life in order to apply this in other aspects? So I'm supposed to be a servant at work, and my boss needs to be there 90 hours a week, so honey, you're just going to have to do without me. Okay, ungodly application, all right? And yet the disposition towards all ought to be not just, I occasionally help you out. We don't think of servanthood as like spare change Christianity. Oh, gosh, look at me. There's got to be some change around here somewhere. No, it is identity Christianity. Whoever would be first among you. And there is no place in this passage to say that Jesus gives the option of, listen, it's okay if you're good with being fifth. That's not the point of the passage. The point of the passage, I'm good with not being first. I would like a sort of mid-level place of glory in heaven, and therefore I'm doing that because I'm going to kind of manage not too much sacrifice, and I'm okay if I get not too much in heaven. I'm, I'm working for that kind of moderating. I'm going to be a middle-class heaven person. Middle-class heaven. I, I, want to, I want to serve just enough where it's nice, but I, I don't, I, you know, I'm not into too much glory. I don't need to be first. Listen, that is to miss the point of the passage. That is to economize what Jesus is saying. His point is we ought to strive for the glory that is truly glorious. His point is not that we be competing with each other. His point is that we want to be great in the eyes of the Lord. Jesus doesn't give this passage to say, therefore, try to calculate. Sit down with the spiritual advisor and decide, well, 
how much glory do you want? And just sacrifice that much. No! No, his point is, shouldn't you want the glory that lasts? The greatness that is. Shouldn't you want to be valuable in the sight of the king? No moderating, quibbling with, well, how much glory exactly do you want? How much sac-? No, no, the point is, you ought to seek first the kingdom of God. You ought to be the slave of all because that's the nature of Christianity. You ought to be running the race in such a way that you could win. We ought to lay our lives down for our wives, our children, our family, our church, our community, our world not in a kind of moderating, caveated way of kind of just, let's, let's be moderate about the whole thing. No, we are seeking to run towards true greatness as Jesus has defined it. The aspiration to be great is not condemned, D. Edmund Hebert says. Greatness in the kingdom is attained by the measure of beneficent services voluntarily rendered. Now, as magnificent as these phrases are, they aren't even the climax of the passage. They aren't even the climax of the passage. The climax of the passage comes there in verse 45. When Jesus gives the most motivating reason of all, look down there, verse 45. Look what he says. For... Why should you do this? You want to pay attention to these little words. They, they show connections between verses in the Bible. These little words, they, they show connections. The therefores and the fors and the because of and since. Those words, they show connections. In other words, what Jesus is about to say is to be the driving engine. If you don't connect the four, it'd be like having a massive engine and you don't connect the link to the trailer called servanthood. The massive engine is what he is about to say. The link is the four, and it can drag us towards servanthood with amazing power if we will show that connection. For, Jesus says, for, 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 why should we do this? For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. There's the engine. There's the diesel. There's the jet fuel. Why ought you to do this? Why ought you, husband, to view your wife as someone you should lay down your life for? Wife, why ought you to lay down your preferences and desires for the sake of serving his ultimate spiritual good? Parents, why ought you to count even your children as those that you ought to serve? Why ought you to have that extra conversation with your neighbor? Why ought you to lay down that physical purchase or that vacation to give for the sake of God's people or his his kingdom. Why ought you to do that? For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Why ought you to do that this week? Because Jesus Christ is the Son of Man, that divine messianic figure. You can read about it in Daniel and Ezekiel, this great servant of the Lord. And yet somehow he came into the world not to demand service, but to give it. So if anyone is tempted to think, listen, I serve a lot. I deserve some appreciation for giving up my rights in order to serve others. They ought to go here. There has never been a person more deserving of servanthood who did more to serve. There has never been. There could never be a greater shock than that the Son of Man, the one whom God has given the right to rule and exercise dominion over all people in all places at all times, should come in and care about what people had for lunch and make sure they had bread to get home. That he would care about the leper and the sick one and this father with his daughter and already do what he's done to serve rather than demand service. That he came into the world looking to serve and not just to serve temporarily, but then to become a ransom. 
a ransom. We know that word because it's in pirate movies and stuff. A ransom. It means that someone is in bondage, captive perhaps to a war, and someone else pays the price to deliver them. A ransom is the price paid to set someone in bondage free. Now, because we are in bondage spiritually and because we have paid the great, great, terrible cost of sinning against the Lord, the wages of that choice is death and death under God's judgment. And so the only ransom that could set us free from that bondage of guilt and hell was death. That was the cost of our release from that bondage. And what did Jesus, the Son of Man, come to do? He came to pay it. He came to pay it. He came to pay it. He came to be a ransom. He came to pay in full the cost for your deliverance from the bondage of sin and death. What did he come to do? To buy you out of slavery and heading towards hell. He came to buy this one who ought to deserve nothing but wrath. And he came to buy them, not with some treasure he would never miss, but the cost of his own life came to be a ransom. What does that mean, Jesus? It means to give his life for many. Here are some of them. Here are some of them. Those in the prison of guilt and condemnation. Here are some of them. What's the most important thing about your life right now if you're a Christian? It's not the bill you have to pay or the fact that your ceiling has a leak. It's not your retirement. It's not your challenging, difficult situation at home. It's not even that wayward child. It's not your health. What's the most important thing about you? You are in bondage to the judgment of God. Rightly because of your sin. And so was I. And Jesus Christ, God's own son, took that payment on himself. So that your chains could fall off and your heart could be free. Brothers and sisters, what kind of engine is that for the call to serve? Is there anything we ought not hold back from Him? Anything? any standard of life, any personal preference, any (laughs) self-reputation we might not gladly cast aside for the sake of his name. If there is any service we think beneath our dignity, let let us spend a while considering our ransom. Are you a proud man or a proud woman? I am. It's amazing how quickly I'm offended by something I perceive as not respecting me enough. It is incredible how quickly I am offended that they didn't appreciate me enough. It is incredible how proud I am. If you are proud and you view others as those who ought to treat you with a certain kind of respect. And ought they to? Yes. (laughs) But that's between them and the Lord. 
But if your pride wells up, spend some time with your ransom. If there's any service that we think is beneath our dignity, let us spend a little while with him and let our pride be cleansed away in his blood. I think James and John spent a lot of time thinking about what they asked, thinking about what he said, and thinking about what he did. So when John writes to the churches, I, John, with you in the tribulation, I think he had a very different heart than when he came to Jesus that day. When James knelt under the sword, I imagine, I don't know, but I imagine there was a smile in his heart thinking about these words. If there is a person that you think requires too much service or who doesn't deserve to be served, Let's spend a while with our ransom. Let's get back in touch with the surprise that he laid down his life for me. There's no one in my life <laughs> more difficult to serve than I was for the Lord Jesus. It is standing before our ransom that drives pride and self-righteousness out of the heart. It's standing before our ransom that softens us towards those it is hard to serve. It's listening to the cries of the Lord taking our place that makes a father come home ready to encourage and labor to lift up his wife and his children that causes a wife to gladly cast aside her self-interest in order to bless her husband. It is considering the wounds of Christ that causes us to despise any part of us that clings to certain possessions or lifestyle rather than gladly laying it down to serve others. Now, I don't know what place the Lord has in heaven for us. I, I don't know. <laughs> I can only imagine the degree to which we'll be celebrating those that are at his right hand and his left hand. I, I just know I will be glad to be in his presence. And in the meantime, what I would like to do, what I know you would like to do, let's be accumulating a lifetime of doing what he did, laying down our life for others, so that when we get there, we can lay that lifetime of service at his feet. Here you are, Lord. Every choice to serve, every turning of the cheek, every moment given up, every refusal to respond to anger with anger, every sacrifice, here you are, Lord. Love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I thank you so much for this dear servant-hearted church. I thank you for the many ways that this church reflects this teaching. I thank you for their love for one another. I thank you for countless meals and moves. I thank you for countless texts of encouragement, countless moments of hospitality, countless Sunday mornings and Wednesday and Tuesday nights and youth meetings where they are laboring to serve. Lord, I thank you that you didn't leave us, Lord, just looking out for our own interests and headed towards judgment, but you rescued us. You made us the recipients of your love, and you set us free, Lord, now to follow you in loving others. 
Lord Jesus, receive the glory as we freshly confess our gratefulness to you.